Next up, we'll be joined by Doug DeVos, Brian Hooks, and Dr. Andrew Abella in a conversation on timeless principles for challenging times. Doug is co-chair of the board of directors for Amway, the world's largest direct selling company with more than $8 billion in revenue. He previously served as president of Amway for more than 16 years. Doug, along with his wife Maria, is the founder of Continuum Ventures, an investment company for the Doug and Maria DeVos family. DeVos is a globally recognized leader whose focus on entrepreneurship and providing opportunity for people around the world to build business of their own has been a lifelong passion. Through the Doug and Maria DeVos Foundation, Doug and Maria help youth, families, and the greater Grand Rapids community and beyond obtain resources to achieve their full potential. Doug also leads the Ambassador Network for Stand Together. Brian Hooks is president of the Charles Koch Foundation and chairman and CEO of Stand Together, a philanthropic community that works with more than 700 business leaders and philanthropists to empower people to realize their unique potential and to help every person rise. Stand Together's comprehensive approach to addressing the country's biggest challenges includes support for more than 1,000 professors at 300 universities, tens of thousands of K-12 teachers, and more than 160 community-based organizations addressing persistent poverty, as well as millions of grassroots activists working to improve public policy. Dr. Andrew Abella is the founding dean of the Bush School of Business and Economics, an associate professor of marketing at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Dr. Abella also provides consulting and training in internal communications. Recent clients of his include Microsoft Corporation, J.P. Morgan Chase, and the Corporate Executive Board. He's the co-editor of A Catechism for Business from CUA Press and winner of the 2009 Novak Award, a $10,000 prize given by the Acton Institute for significant contributions to the study of the relationship between religion and economic liberty. Well, thank you to the Acton Institute for gathering us here together today. Uh, we're going to be having a discussion about timeless principles for challenging times, like we have now. With us today, we have Doug DeVos, who is co-chairman and president of Amway Corporation, which is the world's largest direct sales company, and also a company that has empowered millions of people to become independent business owners. And we have Brian Hooks, who is also in the business of empowerment, and he is the uh, president of the, uh, and CEO of Stand Together, an organization that is focused on empowering people who help others to improve their lives. He's also the co-author with Charles Koch of this excellent new book, Believe in People, and we'll be talking about that uh, quite a bit today. And uh, congratulations, Brian, you've just been nominated to Time's uh, 100 Next list, which is fantastic. That's uh, re really exciting. Uh, I'm Andrew Abel. I'm the dean of the Bush School of Business. It's a, we're a new school of business uh, dedicated to the empowerment of people in the light of the gospel. So the three of us, different backgrounds, uh, we've been working together on a common set of principles uh, th uh, that we believe are particularly relevant for these, these difficult times. So let me start out by asking you, Brian, tell us about Stand Together and your work. Sure. Well, let me first say thank you to, uh, to Chris and Father Sirico and the Acton Institute for hosting this event and also for including the three of us in, in the event. We're very excited to be here. As a native Grand Rapidian, I'm particularly glad to be able to participate in the event today. Uh, and I get to be with two of our best partners at Stand Together. So Stand Together is a community of social entrepreneurs. We're a philanthropic community. Uh, hundreds of the world's and the country's uh, leading business people and, and philanthropists who have come together uh, to solve some of the country's biggest problems. And the way that we do that is by combining our knowledge and our resources to support social entrepreneurs, people who are finding new and better ways to help others to overcome the barriers that are holding them back. And I, I, I've, uh, I've, I've shared uh, with Doug and, and with Andrew that I think that Andrew and what you guys are doing at the Catholic University is a great example of social entrepreneurship. And we're, we're pleased to be a, a proud supporter of the work that you're doing. And so we have a lot of different people that have come together and stand together for a lot of different uh, backgrounds and a lot of different passions. But we all share a common vision. And this is this idea uh, that when we believe in people, when we recognize that everybody has a gift, something to contribute, and we combine our efforts to remove the barriers that are holding them back and allow them to realize their potential, not only do they benefit, 
but that's how society makes progress. And so we invest in these social entrepreneurs with that in mind. And we are a community that was founded by Charles Koch about 20 years ago. Uh, but we are, we are strong because of our diversity of our partnership and the quality of our leadership. And uh, we have uh, uh, proud to be able to say that uh, one of our strong partners, Doug DeVos, is now the chairman of our Frederick Douglass Society, uh, and, which is a group of some of our most engaged partners. Uh, and so, Doug, uh, thrilled, thrilled that you're here to join, join this discussion as well. Thank you, Brian. Um, so, Doug, you, um, Brian already mentioned, so you're, you're heavily involved in, in Stand Together, leading the uh, Frederick Douglass Society. Tell us about that. What, what drew you to be involved in it? What, what are you hoping to accomplish through your involvement in Stand Together? Certain, certainly. Well, thanks, Andrew. And thank you, Brian. And again, Brian, congratulations on your most recent recognition in addition to the other recognitions uh, that you've had. Uh, it's an honor to be here again with our Acton friends uh, and to have this opportunity uh, to, to share a few thoughts and, and, and talk a little bit. And, and Andrew, as I, as I uh, think about the relationship with Stand Together, I, I just have to tell you the first interaction that I had, my mother and father were very involved uh, a bit before I was, and then they invited me to to uh, the first uh, uh, interaction that I had. And, and, and as I walked in, I said, I'm home. This, the, 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 everything that's being discussed here connects with everything that I was raised with. It seemed like a big Amway meeting. Forgive me, Brian, but it seemed, you know, it seemed like it was a, this is perfect. This is exactly what we're talking about. The, the, the principles that, uh, that, that you've written so well about you know, in the book most recently, Brian, and the principles that are espoused and all the things that Charles spoke about at that conference were, were just exactly what we had seen in many, in many cases, how we had tried to put them into practice uh, in the Amway business. And so it was, it was, a, a, it was a, a setting and it was an environment that was incredibly friendly, unbelievably welcoming, and I just felt comfortable immediately. And as uh, I got more deeply involved, the opportunity to uh, engage with the Frederick Douglass Society members, those who are the most uh, engaged uh, in Stand Together, I found people who felt exactly the same way. They had businesses all over the country. They had different interests, different ages, different types of businesses, different perspectives, but they rallied around these, these principles, these values that were important to them, and they wanted to learn how they could continue to express them <clears throat> in different ways in their lives. And so uh, it was a compelling uh, interaction the first time. I, I, I just enjoyed every minute of it and, and felt this is a place where uh, you know, I need to spend a little more time as we move forward here. This is a group of people who are absolutely committed, incredibly thoughtful, have great partners like you, Andrew, and, and many others, um, and, and just uh, are focused on doing, the, doing good things for people in our society uh, and, uh, and working together to make that happen. So, uh, so that's a little bit of the background of, of why we got there. And, so, and thanks again to our, to our Acton friends for uh, giving us this opportunity. That, well, that's terrific. Doug, if I could stay with you for a second. I've heard a story. You, you mentioned how your father um, first connected you to, to stand together. Um, I heard a story about him traveling to Malaysia and getting a, a bigger welcome there than one of the, the government ministers and then teaching an important lesson to that minister. Could you, could you tell us that story? Sure, sure. Well, and it's, it's, I, I tell it often because it connects so much with the principles we talk about. And, and yeah. so this is, uh, you know, in the 1970s, our first trip to, uh, to Malaysia. Amway has been there for a few years at this point. We've got a great start. The business is growing. We're there for our first annual convention. We have a few thousand people that will be at the convention. In those days, when, when, uh, when Dad would arrive at a location, people would greet him at the airport. So there's a few hundred people that were there to, to greet us as we, as we landed uh, at the airport. And before the convention that evening, it was actually the Prime Minister, uh, Dr. Mahathir, uh, who, uh, who visited with Dad, and they talked about the business a little bit. They were just kind of you know, connecting and visiting. And, and as the, the Prime Minister was speaking, he was saying that, you know, it's a tough time economically in Malaysia. He would go on to say that in, in Malaysia, Asia, the greatest natural resources of Malaysia were copper, tin, and oil, and all of those prices were depressed on the global market, and therefore it was a, having a negative impact on their economy. Uh, and, and they continued on with kind of that economic or business discussion. And then, and then he kind of switched it around, and he said, but, 
but you know, your business is doing great. And he referenced all the people that met us at the airport. He said, you have all these people meeting you at the airport. No, nobody ever met me at the airport you know, when <laughs> I return or something. And, and so he uh, joked about that a little bit. And then he said, no, seriously, what, what, what's the secret? And, and, and dad's response was very simple. He said, Mr. Prime Minister, you, you may think the greatest natural resources of Malaysia are copper, tin, and oil. But in the Amway business, we believe the greatest natural resources of Malaysia are the people of Malaysia. And in our business, we invest in people. We create opportunities for people. And, and, and that just set the stage. I was very young uh, at that time, and, and, and Dad repeated that story often, and it, was, it just became the, 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 the defining moment where you just realize of what everything's about. And in any business, you know, Brian, as you know, at Stand Together, as you know, uh, Andrew at, at the Catholic University, if, if you find good people, you can have great things you know, happening in your organization. And, and you're always surprised of where you find great people because somebody you know, may not have the, the written pedigree, but they have the heart and the spirit inside, and that's always been our experience uh, at, at Amway. So that's the, that's the story there that, uh, uh, that we've thought about often. Thank you, Doug. It, it, it really is a, a very powerful story, so thanks for sharing it. And the, the message of people being the greatest asset is something that maybe too many people give lip service to. I want to, Brian, turn to you talk about education with this notion of people being the greatest asset. Um, this fellow I know by the name of Andrew Pudua who once said that the education system in this country isn't broken. It's doing exactly what it was designed to do, which is basically stamp out the same product again and again and again. And I, I don't know that there was ever a good idea, either for employers or, or for people themselves, still less. Uh, it's certainly not a good idea right now. So, Brian, can you talk about what, what, what needs to happen in our, in our educational system to really live as if we truly believe that people are, are our greatest assets? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the bottom line here is that we need an absolute transformation in our education system if we are really going to empower people to realize their potential and contribute and you know, the, the whole purpose of this conference, this notion of how do we address unusually challenging times, uh, and the answer being we get back to some of the principles that we know that have driven progress over centuries, um, really is exemplified by the challenges in education and also, I think, the way that we respond to these challenges. And so you, you look at our education system right now. In K through 12, we're doing things basically the same way that we were doing, we've been doing since the 1950s. In, in higher education, no offense, uh, Andrew is the dean of a very august uh, school of higher education. Things, it, it's incredible to say it's true. Things have not changed for a thousand years, basically, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, you went a thousand years back and you went to a university, it would look a lot like, you know, most universities today. That's a problem, right? You can't say that about very many things. And in a, in a time when, when Americans don't agree on a lot of things, they do agree on this. 80% of Americans say that the education system is not working for students. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's a big problem. I think about the future of our country. I mean, it depends on education. Education predicts the future. And right now, our education system doesn't predict a very good future. And so what, what do we do? Well, I think we go back to these first principles. If we have a deep belief in people, we believe everybody has a gift. And as a society, we benefit, we succeed when we help all people to realize that gift. Uh, education plays a critical role. So as we see it at Stand Together, the purpose of education is to do three things. It's to help people discover their gift. It's to help, help people to develop the skills that can express that gift in a way that, that benefits others. And then to give people an opportunity to apply that gift in a way that benefits themselves by helping others. And if education can take people on that journey, it, it helps them to discover really who they are and, and to realize their potential in a way that benefits themselves by benefiting society. That's education uh, in the ideal. And unfortunately, right now, rather than that kind of three-dimensional education, we have something like one-dimensional schooling, where we're treating uh, all students basically as the same. We've got a one-size-fits-all, as, as your friend said, sort of a, a process to stamp out uh, the same product uh, which is, which is a, a, an awful but, a, but an accurate way, I think, to, to, to think about the way that the education system thinks about students right now. 
And the result should not be surprising. It's not working. And so one of the most compelling ways that I understand this, uh, is it's not working, is when you ask fifth graders, how engaged are you with your studies? Which is a, kind of an odd question to ask fifth graders, but that's what social scientists do. About 70% of them say, yeah, you know what, I'm pretty engaged. By 12th grade, that number shrinks to 30%. And even if you allow for some of the, you know, senior, you know, teenager malaise, that's a terrible, that's a terrible outcome. Because if you're not at all engaged in your studies, how in the world are you going to discover your gift and find a productive way to apply it? And so the answer is not, let's tweak it at the margin. The answer is not, let's get balled up in some of these sort of petty battles, us versus them, you know, public versus private, charter versus whatever, all of that's useful, but it's not, it misses the point. The point is, how do we transform our entire education system so that every student can get an individualized education, an education that is tailored to who they truly are and helps them to go through that three-step process so that they can contribute? And if that sounds like a tall order, uh, it is, but it's not, it's, not a, it's not something that's impossible. It's something that we can absolutely do as a society. People have been doing this uh, in small pockets around the country for a long time. I can't help, I said I was from Grand Rapids, I benefited from this kind of an education from a great program in Grand Rapids, Stepping Stones Montessori School. And that's, that's what the, the, the whole uh, program there is designed to do, is to help bring out who each one of the students are so that they can express their gifts in a way that's productive. But it's not just a program like Stepping Stones. We work with uh, uh, Sal Khan, who's one of the most exciting education entrepreneurs, I think, uh, of this generation. Uh, Sal Khan is the founder of Khan Academy, which is a digital platform that now serves about 100 million students worldwide. Sal is starting a new project in partnership with Stand Together and, and a number of our, our partners called Schoolhouse.World, which is a digital platform that basically allows individualized education for students uh, in cohorts. So it's not just sort of Zoom learning, but students can learn from each other and learn from uh, people who have something to offer to those students. Uh, and, and the beauty of the, of the platform is that it can be individualized at scale. And there are uh, literally hundreds of programs like that that we're supporting right now uh, as, through Stand Together because we see this unique moment in education where people are paying attention, a whole lot of people around the country are realizing just how uh, unsatisfying and broken the system is and there's a real energy to do something about it. And we think that it's, it's time to go big because we can't afford to continue to shortchange students the way that our education system does right now. We can't afford it as a country. Well said, Brian. I'm with you. Couldn't agree more. I'm glad you brought up Sal. I had the pleasure of meeting him at a Stand Together event a couple of years ago. A super inspiring guy. But as you say, one of, of many, right? Many of these innovators who are bringing up new ideas. And it's these kinds of bottom-up solutions, I think, that are the hope for, for, for education, but just, I think, for our society as a whole. Doug, um, in, in the Christian tradition, we use the word uh, subsidiarity to mean, in effect, bottom-up sol solutions, right? Letting people closest to the problem try to find ways to solve the problem rather than imposing top-down solutions. Uh, this is very much, as I understand, the way Amway is, is run. Could you talk about subsidiarity slash bottom-up solutions and, and, and how things work at Amway? Sure, sure. Uh, again, this is why I, I felt so connected uh, at my first Stand Together experience, because, because when you talk about you know, the, a solution from, and, and I'll use the, the term entrepreneur, from, you know, from whether it's a social entrepreneur or a business entrepreneur, when you have somebody who has a drive and a passion, they're going to find a way to succeed, and there's no way I'm going to know their specific situation. Now, now, in Amway, we created a, a few things, a, a bit of, a, a, of an infrastructure. We have a product line, we have a compensation plan, and we have a, a few things to kind of guide the development uh, of our newest independent business owners. Um, but they have to kind of find their own path. And they don't do it on their own in our structure. You have a mentor that works with them and you have access to other people who've been successful and can start with at least a range of suggestions or ideas of what's worked for them. But that doesn't come from the company. It doesn't come from us saying, well, we've done a lot of studies and, and, and here's what you do. And, and in fact, there was a, a story that uh, early on, my dad and Jay had a consultant who was saying, well, you, you know, in Amway, you don't wanna just offer this to anybody. You know, you really want to have some qualifications, you want to give them a test and see if they have sales experience and you want to, you know, do all these other things before you allow them to even get started. And, and Dad and Jay fired him 
And they said to him at the time, they said, who are you going to leave out? Who are you going to leave out? And why are you going to leave them out? We don't know if they have a chance to be successful or not. We don't know if they can go forward. Now, we have, we have standards and rules. They can't do things wrong in the marketplace. But, but people have, from all different backgrounds, have been successful. And some of the most unlikely or unpredictable, I shouldn't say unlikely because they always had that content of character inside themselves, but unpredictable. You would never say, oh, this is the resume of somebody who's going to be ter wonderfully successful uh, in, in the Amway business. And so what we've always done is we've said, we want to offer the opportunity to everybody. And we know there are some people that that that'll just at the beginning say, hey, I don't want to do that. There's other people who say, I'd like to do it, but may not really have the skills and they're not successful. And, and it breaks our hearts, but many times they'll say, I learned something along the way and I be, it, it helped me in something else. Okay, well then we were we were helpful. And then those who've become successful have again very, very different backgrounds of and, and how they became successful, what what they did uh, to, to become successful is a little bit different. And so we celebrate those differences, we celebrate that background, uh, and we recognize uh, what they've done. And, so, and that's the, been the, the strength of our business model. We don't try to tell everybody what to do. We, we set goals, we create conditions uh, for success, we, we, we provide support, um, but uh, it's wonderful to see that entrepreneurial spirit alive and well and, and, and spark in an individual as they uh, start out uh, having a business of their own. It just, it just releases so much energy, right? When, when, you, yeah. when you give people the opportunity to, to, to do this. Uh, so and, these, and, it's not, and it's not easy just to, to go, it's not easy. We've had, sometimes the people that are successful say, you know, I told myself I'm gonna fail 100 times. I'm gonna have 100 people, you know, turn me down on a product sale or, or whatever it is. And, and they said, by the, you know, by the time I got to 100, I was actually successful, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's tough work. You know, it's tough to develop yourself. As Brian talks about these sorts of things, you know, it's tough to find your, you know, your, your, your gifts and then to figure out how to turn them into talents, into skills, and then to apply them. That's, you know, it's not easy work, but that's the most fulfilling and that's the most productive, in, in our opinion. And, and you, you have a, a system and a culture that encourages that, that drives that. And I think it's... Um the more we can replicate that. Brian, just could you generalize this for us? I mean, bottom-up solutions can, can work in a company like Amway. They can work society-wide, right? So Stand Together is involved in poverty alleviation issues. Uh, so talk about um, bottom-up solutions in, 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 the, in the area of issue of fighting poverty. Yeah, that's right. These are, this, these are the, the timeless principles for these challenging times, right? This, this is the story of successful businesses like Doug's, it, it also happens to be the story of our country's success, right? We, we started as a country with a very uh, noble North Star, right? An ideal, I think, best represented by the language in the Declaration of Independence. This notion that when we, when we guarantee equal rights and we recognize that everybody has the opportunity to contribute and pursue their happiness, then we as a society benefit. And of course, right from the start, we never lived up to those ideals. But the progress in our, in our country that has come has been when we've struggled uh, together to address the gaps between the reality and those ideals, address the injustices in our society, and bring more and more people into that noble North Star. And it's the principles of liberation and empowerment, basically. That's been what's, what's uh, caused our country to have such, and frankly, uh, exceptional success. The, uh, the same is true in, in successful companies, especially companies that have succeeded over the long term, as Doug's have. Uh, and, the, and the same principles apply as we're trying to address some of the really big challenges in our society today, challenges like poverty. Uh, and here again, I got to give a shout out to the, uh, to the home team here. Uh, Acton has been a pioneer in this approach you know, for at least the last 10 years, probably more, with, with programs like Poverty Inc. That, that talk about some of these core principles. You know, in the book, we, we basically try to put forward three big ideas. The notion that uh, the solutions to our country's problems are going to look very, lots of different, different solutions to lots of different problems, but they're all going to have this deep belief in people at their core. The notion that we get, when people have, have something to offer and when we help them to unleash that, that's how we're going to solve problems. Second big idea is that the best solutions tend to come when you empower people from the bottom up rather than from the top down. 
And the third big idea is this idea that when we unite with anyone to do right, we can get a lot more done than if we try to go it alone. And in, in tackling a problem like poverty, the best solutions tend to embody those big ideas. And so we look at the way that our society has tended to treat the problem of poverty. Say, take the War on Poverty, for instance, a 60-year program that has spent, by some estimates, more than $15 trillion. And yet the, the rate of poverty in our country has not budged during that period of time. That's a failure. That's an abject failure by any standard. You look at uh, counterexamples of, of, of of programs that, unlike the war on poverty, rather than treating people uh, as problems to be solved from the top down, recognize that the solution to poverty is often found in those who are struggling with poverty themselves. That the solution to our problems are often found in those that are closest to those problems. And we invest in people who are struggling uh, with poverty as the source of the solution. You see extraordinary results. Uh, and I think, again, that's, I think, the lesson from uh, a lot of what Acton teaches. It's the, the, certainly the lesson from our experience quick example of a, of a group that we work with that I think really exemplifies those principles. It's a, it's a group called the Family Independence Initiative. This tiny little group, as Doug says, you know, unlikely organization if you were- It's a great, it's a great a group. It re it's a great group, Brian. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, great, great folks. No, and, 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 and it's, it's, it's realized a whole lot more success through partnerships uh, like the partnership with you, Doug, in Grand Rapids and, and with thousands of people now in communities across the country. Family Independence Initiative, tiny little group out of Oakland, California. Uh, their, their idea is that the solution to families struggling in poverty can be found within the families. What they do is they come alongside families who are struggling with poverty, and they, they help to provide them with, with two things, things that we all need in order to succeed, financial capital and social capital. And that social capital they create by putting families who are in similar situations together. So again, kind of a counterintuitive solution. Families struggling in poverty, you put them together with a cohort of, say, five other families that are struggling. They create, they create bonds and they, they, they begin to help each other. You invest a relatively small amount of capital through their program, about $3,500 on average over two years. Not a lot of money, but enough to make a difference. And on average, families that stick with that program for two years, they increase their income by about 27%. Remember, compare that to the baseline in, in the war on poverty. It's extraordinary results. They tend to double their savings uh, over that period of time. And importantly, that puts them on a trajectory not just to get out of poverty, but to stay out of poverty, which is really the key in addressing uh, persistent poverty, especially generational poverty. And so family independent, what's their secret? Two things. They invest in those families and they're run by people who experience poverty. So the founder of, of the Family Independence Initiative, a guy named Mauricio Miller, uh, is somebody who grew up in poverty. The current president, um, Jesus Herrera, a great guy, somebody who struggled with poverty. He, he's seen what it means to confront those challenges. He's got that personal local knowledge that he can then apply through his organization to empower people uh, in, in tough times, ultimately to overcome those struggles by, by realizing their potential. Uh, and, and it's, you know, these lessons, they just work. And, and you can see those in a lot of the, the groups, I mean, all the groups that we work with. Thanks, Brian. And that's why we're having this conversation is we need to get the, this news out, need to get emphasize sort of the power of these dogs. It sounds like uh, you're involved beyond Amway also in some of these poverty uh, alleviation initiatives. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the, a lot of the, the work that Stand Together does, and, and particularly with uh, FII, is really starting to shape how, how we think about being active because, you know, so it, it's, a, it's frustrating to me personally, my actions sometimes when, you know, from an Amway perspective, we all about, you know, finding that uh, entrepreneurial spark, helping that person be successful, but, but seeing how they drive and go forward. And then on a, on a charitable side, we have a program and we, you know, we think that we have all the solutions because we've, you know, thought about this and we've studied this, but I didn't grow up in poverty. So how do I know it? You know, I, I can listen, I can learn a little bit, but certainly you know, the solutions are going to be much better coming from someone who says, well, here's the reality of the situation. And when you do this, it doesn't work for me. Okay, so how do we do a better job listening and, and thinking in that way and then actually change what each one of us do? So my wife Maria and I are, are just thrilled every time that we 
<clears throat> that we meet a new partner with starting to stand together and we hear what they're doing and we start changing what we're doing because of that. That's what, you know, that's the innovation uh, and you talk about business principles, how you apply them going forward. You have that, that rock solid foundation, but you always, you're, you're always looking to do it better, to find better results as we go forward. And, and that's where Stand Together has found these, these entrepreneurs, these, these ideas, these new ways of doing things that are, are really exciting and compelling. Uh, and they're generating results, which is, which is what we're trying to, always trying to get to. So I, I want to follow your lead, Doug, here. Now, focus us on, more on, on businesses themselves. Okay. Uh, I want to set the stage first with a with a story that, that um, is told in, in Brian and Charles's book, where Charles is visiting, I think it's MIT, um, uh, an MBA class there, and he's, he's talking to the students, and he says, um, the purpose of business is to create, create value for others, to, to basically create value by creating value for others. And one of the smart MBA kids says, I think that's really naive. Isn't the purpose of business just to maximize profits? And, and Charles, I, I love this, his comeback is, he says, you tell me what's more naive, to expect people to pay you money because you're creating value for them or to expect them to pay you money because you're not pay creating value for them. It's like, boom, you know, it just really kind of sets it very clear. But I think what this student was saying is this, this misunderstanding, this kind of trope about business, that the purpose of business is to maximize profits. Um, this assumption that somehow business is purely amoral, it's just about the money, you know? And there's nothing in life that is amoral, because human beings, we are moral beings in the sense that we want to be moral, even though we disagree 10 times a day on what moral means, but we want to be moral beings. So, so when somebody tried to convince folks that, that business is amoral, it didn't work. And so some people tried to bring uh, morality back into business. And the way that's happening this year and last year very concerning to many of us is under this title of woke capitalism, right? So, so where, where businesses are kind of putting on a show of being, being moral, being woke by, you know, paying off the, the, the issue of the day, you know? This is, um, it, it's, it's not constructive for society. It's not actually helpful for a business. It doesn't create value. Um, we have this alternative, uh, Brian, that, that uh, actually the three of us have spoken about principled entrepreneurship, right? So the, the Bush School, uh, we have our own center for principled entrepreneurship, courtesy, courtesy of Art and Sioka, uh, Art and Carly Sioka. So it's the Sioka Center for Principled Entrepreneurship. Everything we teach is grounded in, in the principles of principled entrepreneurship. This is a better alternative than, the, than this woke capitalism stuff. Brian, could you talk about the, the superiority of principled entrepreneurship for actually helping society, not just for businesses, but for the way, the way businesses contribute to society? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to talk about it, Andrew. And as you say, the program at Catholic University is doing just really great work in helping to really breathe life into the, the principles of business. And, and the great thing about that is, and, and you, know, you, you can speak more to this than I can, but I, I've seen it because I've met some of your students, when you show students that they can uh, do well in business by doing good, they get really turned on, right? And, and, and so you, you are providing the, the right answer. Uh, I, I think you're right. I think this notion of woke capitalism or call it stakeholder capitalism as some have, I think it's very dangerous. Uh, I think it's not only going to destroy business or, or could, but it also is going to not accomplish any of the, the social goals that it purports to. In fact, I think it makes a lot of those problems worse. Uh, but I do think that we have to take seriously the motivation. You know, I, I look at it this way. I look at woke capitalism is the wrong answer to the right question. And the right question is how, how can business be a force for good in society? And you've given the answer. That, you know, our answer is through principled entrepreneurship. The notion that businesses succeed when they create value in society. And, you know, it's easy to understand and, 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 um, and, and the business leaders in this, in this uh, audience, I'm sure, know this stuff better than I do, but it's easy for people to understand that businesses create value for their customers. As you said, what's, it's naive to think of anything else. But it's a lot more than that, right? And, and as the business leaders here know, to succeed over the long term, you need to strive to be the preferred partner, not just to your customers, but to your employees, right? You need good people to work for you uh, for, for a long time for the other people who you count on to make you successful. You need to make sure that you're treating your suppliers well. You need to make sure you're treating your community as well. All of that is part of good business. 
and the measure of whether or not you're being successful in being that partner to all of your constituents, you're creating value in society, is your profit. And if that's how you're making profit, you know, you're doing well by doing good. The problem, and I think we, we really important to acknowledge this problem, we write about this in the book, is that there's a whole lot of businesses that are making profit through other means, through uh, rigging the system, through looking to the political process to get rich quick at the expense of their customers or their employees or, or, or what have you. And you see this uh, through you know, things like uh, bailouts, for instance, right? Uh, absolutely unacceptable. We call that corporate welfare. Uh, or you see that through businesses that sort of collude with uh, the government to create regulations that they can, they can abide by, but it makes it really hard for new businesses to come into the market and compete with them. That's not fair. And, and so when, when, when people see that that's how businesses are making money, they get upset and they say, wait a minute, you're not creating value in society. We got to do something about that. And so their, an their answer, woke capitalism or stakeholder capitalism, uh, is, is the wrong answer, right? It's actually going to make that problem worse. If the problem is people are looking to the political means to profit, you don't want to put more politics into that, into that equation. Right. The, the right answer, though, is principled entrepreneurship. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Can I jump in a little bit here? Yeah. And, and just a, an observation. That I, I, Andrew, I love, I love that story about Charles because Charles, I find to be unbelievably intelligent, incredibly thoughtful, and yet he's able to communicate a very simple, powerful message that we can all understand. And sometimes, and again, for all of us in the audience, we like to, you know, like to figure out all the knowledge that we have and find a lot of words to use. And sometimes bringing it down to just the cut to the chase, the simple message that, that business is and must be a social good. Brian's articulated beautifully how, how business can get off track and, and take away from the fabric of society, take away from innovation and entrepreneurship and, and, and competition, and take away from the ability of creating value in the marketplace for a customer and employees and communities and supplier networks, all those sorts of things. It, it just Brian, I, I love listening to how, how you go through that, but the observation to pull out, and for all of us, who, you know, all of us at, this, uh, at this conference, think through the simplicity of the communication. And your values, what what you believe, because on this woke capitalism question, Brian, exactly, it's the right question. These are topics of the day we must address. But let's be really, really thoughtful about answers that will really generate results. And if you just take the war on poverty example, there's been a lot of answers, but they haven't generated the results. And so we can think about what's the right answer for you and your business? What are your values? How are you going to express them so that you're creating value in the marketplace for your customers, your employees, your communities? Um, and I think that's just a, a hugely important topic. And, and, and we are, you know, we, you know when, when Amway started, Dad and Jay just kind of lived that. We grew up in that. We're doing it. We're continuing to refresh that discussion. That's a tough discussion. And those answers aren't simple. Uh, but it's well worth the journey. So I, I just had to, to dive in on that part. Sorry, excuse me. No, for I, a, for a, no I think that's yeah. exactly right. And, the, and to me, the very cool thing about all of this is that it's something we can all do, right? Do the right thing. You know, even when it's tough, do the right thing. And as business leaders, you know, as, as tough as things are right now, when you look at where, where do people in our country look for leadership, there's a lot of institutions that are really at the bottom of that list. You know, government is at the bottom of that list, right? People do not trust government leaders right now, and for, for, for frankly, for good reasons. You know who they do trust more than anybody? It's business leaders. Yeah. And so when they see business leaders doing the right thing and setting that example, uh, that's a powerful uh, signal. It's a powerful way to help people to really kind of see what, what the right thing is. And, and the converse is also true. When they see business leaders do the wrong thing, that makes a, a very negative impression. So we've all got the opportunity on this one, I think, to really help to make progress just, just through doing the right thing. I, I think so. I think part of the problem is, in effect, there are two kinds of capitalism, but we call them both capitalism. But one 
crony capitalism proceeds by just trying to sequester as much value as you can for yourself, regardless of value creation. The other one succeeds through innovation and creating value for others. Unfortunately, we use the same name for both. We should somehow split that and just, they're two very, very different things. But the, the innovative, the, the sort of principal entrepreneurship capitalism, that's the one that serves society. And, and Doug, I'm, I'm glad you were giving those uh, examples from, from Amway because this is something that, clearly, this is what you guys are doing. I want to ask you, though, about, about servant leadership. I think it, there's a certain sort of humility that is needed um, in order to run an, a, a large enterprise that is truly consistently oriented to serving others. Could you say something about, uh, say more about servant leadership? Yeah, a a absolutely. And, and uh, we've had a lot of fun at Amway talking about this in the same way. And there's, you know, there's uh, a lot of misperceptions about that. You know, uh, the, the, originally some of the discussions that I was involved with at the company were like, well, you know, it's just everyone's being nice to each other and you're taking care of each other and you're serving each other. And it's like, well, that's, that's not exactly it. It, 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 servant leadership is understanding your role as a leader wherever you are in the organization. You have a responsibility to people, so it's your role and your responsibility in filling that role uh, and making sure that you're answering the questions that you need to answer as a leader. That, that if you're the CEO, you, know, that you, better, you better have the answers for strategy and you better be clear about setting the targets and you better understand how, how, how people are going to advance and develop in the organization and how you're going to continue to have the right people in the right place and, and, and be able to communicate that clearly and easily and evaluate whether you're doing well or not. Uh, and being honest with people and saying, hey, you're, you're making it work or you're not making it work and here's how I can help you make it work but you do set clear standards, and that's how you serve. Now, you don't serve by trying to show everybody that you're smart and do their jobs for them or wait for them to, to delegate up and ask you all the questions so you can answer and you can sit behind your desk or wherever you want to sit and say, well, I've got all the answers. In fact, I found, you know, I had one wonderful experience. I was early in my career, uh, had two experiences. I'll, 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 I'll share them quickly. One, I was brand new uh, in my role as a general manager at Amway UK, and, um, and uh, uh, I didn't want to screw up. It was a relatively small operation, about 70, 80s employees, and, and very early. And, and so I didn't want to make a mistake, so I didn't make any decisions at all. I just kind of would sit there and think about stuff. And finally, my boss came over and said, look, closed the door to my office and said, look, I don't care what you do. Flip a coin if you have to, but make a decision. That's your job. You have to make a decision. Uh, and so I'm like, okay, I, I take that in. There's another time where I, I, I took a decision, but I realized that I wasn't the right one to take the decision. I was involved with our meetings and programs team. We had a convention. There was a program happening on stage. I was backstage, and I had an old uh, uh, run of show uh, document in front of me and I thought that this group of people was the next group to go on stage and I re realized they weren't going on stage so I grabbed them I said you gotta go 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 and I threw them all on stage and the actual manager of the production looked at me and he said we changed the program they weren't supposed to go on stage we'll make it work <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's okay so I realized you know what an idiot I am when I try to do somebody else's job they're far more qualified they're far more qualified to do that. I have my role, they have theirs. We have to work together. And, and, and especially depending where you are in leadership, your, your ability to encourage and help others work together. So servant leadership brings in all those aspects of, uh, of, of fulfilling that leadership role without abdicating your responsibility because that's how you serve the organization. And, and so, um, so I, I think it's a, a, a great concept but it's, it's the, and you, you rightly hit on the humility aspect because you need to also be aware, like my uh, story on the, on the production, <laughs> on the, uh, and there's a lot of other stupid things I've done too. I could spend a lot of time uh, uh, on that front, but um, recognize that, you know, they, that the people you work with are really smart in their areas and, and you need to respect what they're recommending, what they're saying, what they're doing uh, as a servant leader and, and accept that. Um, and, 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 and just you know, walk with them while they're making great decisions and doing great work to help the organization move forward. So, uh, so there's got to be a huge element of, of humility of to know what you know, what your role is, and then what it isn't, you know, and, and what you have to back away from. Thank you, Doug. Uh, 
it, it, it's a profound thing. Um, Brian, humility is actually one of the guiding principles of Coke Industries, right? So this is, yeah. this is a big deal. Um, it, t tell us a little about how, 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 from your perspective, I think Doug makes a really good case from, from, from his experience at Amway. From your perspective, why does humility rise up so, so high? And then I have one more question for Doug, and then I think we, we, we reach the end of our time. So over to you, Brian. Great. Well, I, I mean, I, I'll just kind of build on what Doug said. I, I think he, he really summed it up. The, the, um, you know, the, the principles at, that we have uh, both at Stand Together and, as you say, at Coke, really are designed to help to um, empower employees to be able to make good decisions based on you know, whatever comes, comes at them. And so they know what we're trying to accomplish. They sort of know what our vision is. They understand the resources that they have to apply towards that vision, and they know what the principles of just conduct look like. And those principles that are going to help to make them effective within our culture, you know, we want to we want to empower them to create value. And so humility is a critical aspect of that culture uh, for for a lot of reasons. Um, one is this notion that you know, no matter how well we're doing, uh, whoever we are, whatever our, our company is, we can always do better. And uh, we, we, we look to a principle uh, that um, a social scientist named Joseph Schumpeter came up with uh, called creative destruction. And, and uh, what he said was, uh, to describe creative destruction, he said that the, uh, the earth beneath the business, the business leader's feet is always crumbling. And he used that metaphor to kind of describe the, what, what happens given the pace of change and the need for continual uh, in innovation, continual transformation. Now, he wrote that, that, uh, that concept back in the 40s. And so if the pace of change in the 40s caused the ground to crumble beneath business leaders' feet, imagine what it's doing now, <laughs> given the pace of change. And so if, if you don't have the humility to say, hey, no matter how well I'm doing, I can always do better, somebody else is going to give you that humility the hard way. So you, you, might, as well bring it, you, you might as well bring it yourself and, and, and continually looking for better ways to do things, being open to learning how you can do things better. But the second aspect of it really gets to what Doug was talking about, this idea that, um, you know, as good as you might be at something, you're not going to be good at everything. And if you know uh, what you're good at, you also ought to know what you're, what you're not so good at, and then have the humility to go out and seek partners who complement your capabilities. And when you do that, and I mean that ultimately, I mean, our organization's called Stand Together for a reason, right? When we seek partners who share vision, who share values and who bring complementary capabilities, uh, we can and we work together. We can accomplish a whole lot more than any one of us can on our own. I don't. I don't care how good we are or you are at at at, at anything. We can always do do better when we combine uh, capabilities in a partnership uh, that's characterized by those three things. And but to do that, I think you really do have to take humility seriously. Thank you, Brian. That that's. It's just it's so important. Uh, okay, let me close with one last question. And, and just, going just to recognition, if I can, Andrew. You know, sure. The, the humility starts at the top. Charles is just such a humble, straightforward person. He's just brilliant in how he demonstrates that. It, it really has to start at the top, doesn't it, Doug? I mean, if, yeah. if the, the leaders aren't modeling that, then it's just, it's just not going to work. I, okay, so, so last question. Um, going off on a slightly different tangent, but, but come back to particularly the topic of, of innovation. So, Doug, something you and I are both passionate about, sailing. So, so, so you're actually in New Zealand now, right, with, for the America's Cup, so that's fantastic. Um, and so I, I want to, I, you know, um, full disclosure, I'm somewhat of a traditionalist, so I want to raise maybe a controversial subject in sailing, which is, you probably guessed it, foiling, right? So foiling, boat is shooting across the top of the, over the surface of the water, riding on a, on a foil, you look at that and you could be excused for thinking, that's not sailing, that's flying. That's like a hang glider going sideways over the water, right? So, okay, but I get it. This is innovation and it's exciting innovation and I look forward someday to having a small foiling dinghy that I can take out. But, but here's the thing, as I read about this, I learned that there's all kinds of rules about the foil and it can only be this shape and you can only get this part from this manufacturer, and it used to be it couldn't move, now only this one part can move. It seems like a lot of heavy regulation. Is this going to be actually stifling the innovation in, in, in sailing? Yeah, Andrew, you know, once you get me going on sailing, it could be a while. But um, you know, the, the idea uh, you know, of, uh, you know, the, of innovation in our sport, uh, in, in like anything, is, 
is wild and people are thinking of things all the time. Now in the competition of the America's Cup, you do need to put some sort of rule around it, but it's a great illustration of kind of crony capitalism, if you will, because in this competition, the amount of time we spend talking about the rules and the amount of, and the way that one team is trying to talk about the rules to impact another team, because as soon as innovation is seen when another team found an innovation, then the rest of the teams all get together and say, hey, that innovation's outside the rules. You know, you know? And so they make a new rule to kind of hold it back and, and to, to do different things. We, we had a, uh, you know, my, my father had a, a fun story years ago in the, in the National Basketball Association when you know, we were involved with the Orlando Magic and we weren't doing that well. And, and we thought we should have regulations on Michael Jordan. You know, Michael Jordan, you know, he, he jumps too high, he runs too fast, he shoots too well. So once he gets to, uh, you know, 40 points a game, that's it. You got to take him out, you know, because you just can't have that anymore. And, we, you know, so the rest of the NBA should, should create rules to limit his innovation, his creativity, his skills. And, and if he jumps higher than, than a certain amount, like the average of what our team could jump, well, then we should, you know, we, we should, you know, call a foul and, you know, hit the, turn the ball over. And you can see how silly that sounds in a sporting example. And in the sailing example, it, 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 it how, how, you know, there's some rules that you need to have in the marketplace too, but you can see how it gets misused in a competitive sense to wipe out the skill, the innovation, the talent, the creativity of a, of a potential competitor. And if you apply that in sport, you see how silly that sounds but yet that's being applied in business uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So, uh, so we think that uh, innovation in, in sport in our competition is still uh, an incredible innovation inside that, but you hit a, a perfect illustration. There's so much time talking about the rules and some of the team meetings that you know, the lawyers come in and then the rules experts come in and then we talk about this and this and here's an interpretation that happened. It was, you know, the, the first hire was actually the lawyer. <laughs> you know, on the sports team, uh, you know, that, that wow. we did uh, many, many years ago. So, uh, you know, so when you put, you know, these principles that are happening in the marketplace into a sports connotation, they seem silly. So why wouldn't they be silly on the business side? And, and so for all of us who are uh, attending, we have, be engaged in what's happening around you. You know, it, it, be engaged, you know, uh, you know, Bill Seedman, when, when, when Gerald Ford became president, Bill Seidman was a local uh, uh, a guy in Grand Rapids. Uh, many of you know the Seidman School at uh, Grand Valley State, so certainly you would you'd be aware of some of that history. But I remember he told the dad he told Dad and Jay said, "You better pay attention to Washington, because they got the power to put you out of business." Uh, and, and so you better pay attention to what's happening in the marketplace around, uh, and 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 be active finding good solutions. Uh, there's still problems. We can agree there's problems. We can be better, but we should all be active together finding good solutions. And, and so uh, we'll have more time to talk about sailing, uh, Andrew, as we go forward and, and how things are, are working down here with the America's Cup. But uh, uh, great illustration, a great way to uh, use sport to connect back uh, to business and the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. And thank you, Brian, for giving us the time. I think we had a good, good conversation here. Hopefully, we're giving people a, a bunch of things to think about and some good, some good inspiration here. So thank yeah, you both. Yeah, thank you.